Hello, Moon Valley, and happy Easter. My Easter sermons typically begin with a traditional uh, declaration and response. I declare, he is risen, and uh, you respond, he is risen indeed. And I see no reason to let social distancing interfere with our tradition. And so, uh, here we go. He is risen! He is risen! I'll be honest, I, I, I don't hear a thing, uh, but, but I'm, I'm trusting you. Today we are uh, continuing our sermon series titled, Now I See, and it's a study through the Gospel of John, and uh, the biblical text we're studying today is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, and uh, what do you know? This just so happens to be the Apostle John's account of the resurrection of Jesus, just like I planned it uh, many months ago. But what I didn't plan and what I couldn't possibly foresee is how John's account speaks to us in such a powerfully relevant way concerning the pandemic we're now facing this Easter. You know that the pandemic has made it painfully clear that we're really not in control of our circumstances. Our most gifted minds, our most powerful countries, our most advanced technologies, our most rigorous protections are being humbled by a tiny virus. And this tiny virus threatens not only our physical health, but also our financial stability, our emotional security, and even our sense of relational connectedness. And think of it, the greatest, most powerful nation on earth can't seem to produce enough toilet paper. The fabric of our lives that just weeks ago seemed so pressed and proper is now um, unkempt and unraveling. I think what we're experiencing is a, a kind of empty tomb. 2,000 years ago, the empty tomb looked like a tragedy. At first, the eyes of those who beheld it saw nothing encouraging about the emptiness. Their eyes saw nothing good, only something gone. Their eyes saw nothing to give them hope, only something to haunt them. Their eyes could only see the emptiness that brought them grief and made them weep over the fate of their crucified hero, the, uh, a fate that just seemed to get worse and worse, and it made them worry about their own fate. As we work our way through this biblical text, we're going to discover how strikingly visual it is. If you circle the words saw and look and seen in our text, you'll be doing that nine times. And what you can't see in English is that John uses four different Greek words for seeing, not to emphasize different ways of seeing, because I think they're all used synonymously, but to emphasize it's just a lot of seeing going on. The, the followers see an empty tomb. And to emphasize the, 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 the pictorial aspect further, John, an eyewitness, provides a lot of visual details that may seem otherwise irrelevant. Like, like, who cares who wins the foot race to the empty tomb? And, and who cares if Jesus' face cloth is uh, folded up neatly and put in its own place? Well, I think John is inviting us to see what they saw then, to, to, to feel what they felt then, an empty tomb. 
John also wants us to know that there's a problem with their seeing. Five times, John describes or quotes Jesus' followers in our story as not knowing or not understanding or supposing something contrary to fact. They are seeing but not understanding. They're lacking a proper perspective. It's as if the empty tomb is, is all that they can see, that their field of vision is just swallowed by it. They, they can't see past it. In the first 11 verses of our text, the term tomb is repeated nine times. An English teacher may suggest that John occasionally used the pronoun it for variety. But John seems to want us to know there is no variety. They just see an empty tomb, tomb, tomb. But then suddenly the word tomb vanishes, vanishes from view as if to mark a change in perspective. The Lord draws his followers to see beyond the empty tomb. In reality, the emptiness of the situation doesn't change at all. Only their perspective of it does. Jesus had still suffered horribly. Jesus had still died a shameful death on the cross, the, the tomb still empty, and the followers still face a hard road. Many will be martyred. Nevertheless, we're going to see grief pushed out by joy. We're going to see crippling fear swallowed up by an abounding hope. Today, I wonder if we need such a change of perspective. I wonder if this pandemic is, is like an empty tomb for us. I wonder if we're seeing but not understanding. I, I, I wonder if Jesus is trying to get us to see beyond the emptiness right now. Here's the big idea I draw from our text. It's, it's the thing I want you to remember. With our eyes, we see an empty tomb. With our faith, we see an abounding hope. My prayer for you is that you may be able to see life today with a fresh set of eyes, that you may be able to see things differently, that you may experience the change in perspective that the early followers experienced in our text, that you may be able to see right through the empty tomb to the abounding hope. Let's enter the story and see if we can experience the change right along with the earliest Jesus followers. John 20, verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now the first day of the week is Sunday. Jesus was crucified the previous Friday. It is uh, <clears throat> now the third day after, counting Friday. Mary is a woman from the little town of Magdala on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. About three years earlier, she had uh, been possessed by seven demons when Jesus miraculously cast them out and healed her. Mary had been following Jesus ever since. She heard his teaching. She saw his ways. She followed him to the cross, saw him crucified heard him cry out, it is finished. And she followed him to the tomb, saw his lifeless body wrapped up, and watched the stone rolled in place over the tomb. And now, on this early Saturday morning, she comes, perhaps just to grieve, or perhaps to put the finishing touches on the, the burial preparations that had be begun on Friday afternoon, but were maybe interrupted uh, by the Jewish Sabbath on which no good Jew was allowed to do any work. 
But she sees that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, and not only that, the tomb is now empty. And on the basis of the evidence she sees, Mary concludes that someone has stolen the body of Jesus, perhaps to to desecrate it and uh, to, to make a mockery of his memory. Verse 2 continues, So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and, and, and we do not know where they have laid him. Note that Mary is now operating on the, the reasonable but false assumption that the body has been stolen. Emptiness often invites us to make false assumptions, usually negative, usually worrisome. Verse 3 and 4 continue. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, the other disciple is almost certainly the Apostle John, the writer. John wants us to know that he outran Peter. Sounds like a guy thing. Uh, But he's just giving us the visual details of an eyewitness. Verse 5 goes on. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Again, more visual details about the scene. I suspect it does not occur to John and Peter in this moment, but there's There's strong evidence right before their eyes that that the body probably had not been stolen. That they're seeing but not yet understanding. In that day, grave robbery was a crime punishable by death. Get caught and you would be executed. So why would a grave robber take the time to unwrap the body right there in the tomb at the risk of getting caught? And if a grave robber did take the time to remove the claws in the tomb, it would only serve to make the theft much more difficult. Um, I know it's gross to think about, but an unwrapped corpse would then be a slippery mess, hard to move, all greased up with aloes and myrrh. And why would a grave robber take the time to carefully fold the face cloth and and put it in its own place? And why would a grave robber leave the most most valuable materials in the tomb, the, the linen cloths and the aloes and myrrh? No, this bears none of the marks of a grave robbery. They see the evidence, but, but they don't understand it. Verse 8 goes on. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, went in, and he saw and believed. He believed. Now, it seems that a clear majority of interpreters take this to mean that John now believes Jesus has has risen from the dead. I'm not one of them. I'm a dissenter. Strictly speaking, we're not told what John believes. We are left to speculate based on context. And to me, the best explanation is that John now believes Mary's contention from verse 2 that the body had been stolen. There are at least two lines of evidence to support this. First, in that day and culture, the testimony of a woman was considered so unreliable as to be inadmissible in a court of law. And so culturally, it would be understandable that the leading male disciples would not want to seek corroboration of Mary's testimony. And it's also understandable that John would bother to note that he actually came to believe the, the woman's testimony. Second, the, the very next verse provides 
even stronger evidence. Verse 9 says, For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. The little word for is a conjunction introducing an explanation for John's belief. You see, various uh, passages in the Old Testament foreshadow the resurrection of the Messiah, but these prophecies are are few in number and, and not crystal clear. And so John and Peter do not yet understand these prophecies. They haven't connected the dots in the scripture. And this makes perfect sense as an explanation of John's belief in Mary's contention that Jesus' body is stolen, not risen. He believes her because a resurrection of the Messiah is not even on his radar. Jesus rising from from the dead is not what he expects because he does not yet understand the prophecies about the resurrection. And so verse 10 continues. Then the disciples went back to their homes, Peter and John, go home. If uh, they believe the body has been stolen, there's nothing more to be done at the empty tomb except maybe be accused of stealing the body and then be executed for it. And so they they get out of there. But Mary is uh, seemingly unconcerned about being accused of anything. In verse 11, it says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. The original Greek word translated weeping is a very strong term. Uh, This is not just the shedding of a few quiet tears. This is full-on wailing. This is ugly crying. Her fears seem to have been confirmed by John concurring that The body has been stolen. And this is the height of emptiness in our text. This is where the the bad news reaches a crescendo. As if the crucifixion of the man who healed her were not bad enough, his dead body will now likely be desecrated and the name of Jesus will be further mocked and ridiculed. The empty tomb seems horrible, but a change is coming. This is the last time the word tomb is used in our text. The Lord now gradually begins to draw Mary to a different point of view, a perspective that sees beyond the empty tomb. And Jesus does not force her to recognize him, but gently grants her the dignity of discovery. Let's join your transformation. Verse 12 says, And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Hmm. Two angels in white. You're probably thinking, that should do the trick. Light should go on now, right? Not quite. Verse 13 says, They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Mary is sticking with her false assumption, repeating nearly word for word, what she had said to Peter and John back in verse 2. So Jesus does a little more to invite a change of perspective. Verse 14 says, Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. Wow! Jesus standing right there. Right there before her eyes. You're you're thinking, that should do the trick. The light should go on now, right? Not quite. Rest of verse 14 says, But she did not know that it was Jesus. You may be thinking, well, how could she not know? Well, it's very hard to see anything that doesn't fit our 
preconceptions. The mind can easily dismiss what it considers impossible. And so Jesus keeps gently inviting a change of perspective. And in verse 15, it says, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Okay, first two angels, then the visual of Jesus standing there. Now the voice of Jesus, which repeats the question of the angels, woman, why are you weeping? And then tacks on the leading question, whom are you seeking? And these are not questions seeking answers because Jesus already knows the answers. They are questions inviting a change of perspective. And you're thinking, this should do the trick. The light should go on now, right? Not quite. Verse 15 continues. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Mary is still not understanding the situation. She wrongly assumes Jesus must be the gardener. This is a rich man's tomb, and apparently they have gardeners. And Mary suspects the gardener may be the culprit. How ironic. Mary assumes her creator and savior is the thief and the yard guy. At this point, you and I may be tempted to label Mary something like obtuse, but that would be hypocritical, at least in my case, because sometimes I worry. Sometimes I assume the worst. Sometimes my own empty tombs seem so big that I can't see through them to anything good. Sometimes I need a change of perspective. And I think we need such a change right now. Auditoriums are empty. Offices are empty. Store shelves are empty. Classrooms are empty. News reports on TV are empty. Bank accounts are empty. Energy levels are empty. But the big idea is full of truth for you and me. With our eyes, we see an empty tomb. With our faith, we see an abounding hope. And here comes the hope in verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. Jesus addresses her by name, as if no other thing on earth is more important to him in this moment. Mary. I, I imagine the tone of his voice conveys tenderness and compassion and love. She likely heard Jesus say her name in this same way several years earlier at the heels of another, a previous empty tomb after Jesus had just cast out seven, seven demons that had tormented her. Mary. Do you think the Lord may be calling you by name right now in this emptiness? Are you sitting still long enough these days to hear it? I've never heard the Lord's verse, uh, voice audibly with my ears, but sometimes my heart hears when I sit still long enough to listen. I have never seen the Lord physically with my eyes, but sometimes my heart sees when it looks beyond the emptiness to find him. And he's always there. 
standing right in front of me. You may think you're not important enough. You may think you're not good enough for God to address you personally like this. And I I imagine that's what Mary may have thought. And one reason she may have found it so difficult to to recognize Jesus is, is that she never expected to be the first. She never expected to be the first one to whom a resurrected Jesus, the Savior, would appear. She never expected to be the first before everyone else. If if Jesus wanted to make a real splash, if, if Jesus had any sense of branding, if Jesus had consulted an ad agency, he would surely know to appear before somebody who is more culturally influential, somebody more credible, somebody without baggage. Not a woman. Not a lower class woman, not a lower class woman who has had demon possession problems. What was Jesus thinking? He was thinking about Mary and he's thinking about you. Mary finally hears, she finally sees, not because her eyes are so perceptive, but because the Lord's grace is so persistent. Verse 16 continues, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Aramaic was the day-to-day language of Israel in the first century. Rabboni is probably what Mary had called Jesus ever since she had known him, an endearing, respectful term. And then Mary embraces Jesus. And it's not a tentative, careful embrace. It's a desperate, bear-hugging, I am never going to let you go kind of embrace. And, And we know this from verse 17 that says, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And this can sound almost rude to our modern ears, as if Jesus were saying something like, don't touch me because I'm super holy now and and you might defile me. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Mary has already, she, she has him in this vice grip bear hug. All Jesus is saying is something like, Mary... No need to capture and contain me. Um, I'm not leaving yet. I'll, I'll be with you for a while. And then Jesus does something even more remarkable. He entrusts Mary to be the first person to carry the good news of Easter to others. Mary's the first. Verse 17 continues, But... Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now, the brothers uh, refers to the disciples, including Peter and John. The message from Jesus to them through Mary to us is, I am risen and I am ascending. And that message sheds a whole new light on the empty tomb, even though some things have not changed at all. The tomb is still empty. The cross is still bloodstained. The suffering, still a horrible fact. The death is still real. The scars on Jesus' hands and feet and sides still bear painful testimony, and we know from history that many of the brothers will likewise suffer and die horrible deaths. But now we see beyond the emptiness of the tomb. Jesus has overcome it all. He has risen in victory over it all. He is ascended and now enthroned over it all, not as some distant, detached king who cannot relate to our suffering, 
but as one who has entered into our pain, as one who has taken on our weakness, our loneliness, as one who has taken all our darkness upon himself in payment for our sin, and as one who is risen so that we with Mary can one day rise in glory with him. Do you see the change? With our eyes, we see an empty tomb. With our faith, we see an abounding hope. And the last verse of our text, verse 18, says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. Mary declares, I have seen the Lord. Had she seen the empty tomb? Yes. Was the tomb still empty? Yes. Did her hero still die? Yes. But Mary sees beyond that now. She sees with new eyes of faith. She sees the Lord in and through all this, she sees the one who was and is with her as she weeps. She sees the one who calls her by name in the middle of the emptiness. She sees the one who said the words that now finally make sense. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So emptiness is no longer a threat. No lockdown can keep us down. No distancing can distance us. No virus can infect our salvation. No death can touch our new life. We can look at death squarely and say, Oh, death. Where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? You got nothing on me because I have everything in Jesus. With our eyes, we see an empty tomb. With our faith, we see an abounding hope. And all this because he is risen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the empty tomb. Thank you for rising from it to give us abounding hope, hope to all who believe in Jesus. Help us, Lord, help us to see through the emptiness of our present circumstances to see you. Amen.